Hello, everybody. This is Frederik Gudo speaking from the Wuppertal Institute. I hope you can hear me and I will now start the webinar on innovative financing mechanisms, new business models and public procurement for sustainable urban transport and mobility. Welcome, everybody. This is me. <laughs> Uh, this webinar will be also recorded, so uh, those people who cannot attend now, they can see this then later on YouTube. Uh, but the obvious added value of this uh, webinar attending now here live is that we can interact a little bit um, and uh, discuss some questions that may arise from the presentations we have. So we have prepared three presentations about um, those topics, innovative financing mechanisms, new business models, and public procurement in the field of sustainable urban transport and mobility. Um, and uh, the webinar starts now. But before we engage with the topic, just, uh, just some introductory slides about first about the Civita Suits project. So this is a webinar of the uh, Suits project, which is a four-year uh, research and innovation action funded by the European Commission. And uh, we are also part of the Civitas of the Civitas family. So those uh, cities that engage in a network for cleaner transport and Suits has a socio-technical approach to developing capacity in small and medium-sized local authorities. So this is our target group. We provide guides and guidelines and tools, and we share best practice from larger and medium-sized authorities um, to meet the requirements of small and medium-sized cities uh, in different fields. We provide different modules, um, which you can see. Uh, you should now be able to see my slides. You can't see uh, myself, um, but that will come in a few minutes as well. So again, this is the introduction to the uh, Suits project. Uh, we are working with small and medium-sized cities on different modules. Uh, one of those is innovative financing, one of those is procurement. There are other modules and there will be other webinars um, and also e-learning courses coming up. Um, I will uh, introduce this later. Uh, Today, the objective of this webinar is um, to uh, closing the capacity gaps of um, uh, in, in small cities um, of methods in financing sustainable mobility through information and sharing knowledge. So we have provided, uh, we have um, developed three presentations, one on innovative financing schemes, one on business models for new and emerging transport schemes, and then the last presentation will be about public procurement and the public procurement reform in the EU. Um, and as already mentioned, there is also a corresponding e-learning course, uh, which can be accessed on the uh, new urban agenda campus.org platform. Uh, you see the link on the lower end of this slide. Mm. And the e-learning course will also uh, be about those three topics you can register from tomorrow. Um, so these are the speakers of today. Alexei Lugovoy, uh, he is Senior Transfer Planner uh, at Arcadis. Alexei will present the uh, existing funding me me mechanisms and the process to sustainable financing used for transport and mobility projects, mainly in small and medium-sized cities, as this is our target group. Then we have Jana Dulskaya, uh, who is researcher at Euroclass Research Innovation and Finance. Jana will provide insights to modern mobility trends um, and identify the most successful mobility services and their business models in the sector. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Stefan Rosiano from um, Integral Consulting R&D. And Stefan will introduce the new EU legislative framework for public procurement. Um, and um, he will also guide um, how to apply schemes for innovative procurement uh, to successfully plan and implement innovative sustainable mobility measures. Um, I also uh, already mentioned uh, this e-learning course. So the course um, will start from tomorrow. It is structured in five units. Uh, the first unit is quite straightforward, the welcome and introduction unit. Then we have uh, three um, units which are supposed to be guidelines to 
applying innovative sustainable financing approaches and also guidelines and learning uh, slides to um, innovative procurement and uh, to developing bankable projects in the field of yeah um, mobility services so new business models and partnerships um, to new uh, transport projects and then the last unit will be a recap and conclusions unit and on the right hand side of this slide which you hopefully can see now uh, you can see a screenshot of the uh, e-learning platform new urbanagendacampus.org slash e-learning uh, I can show you this later as well so this will start again tomorrow it will be moderated by me for a time span of six weeks so until uh, 27th of July uh, it can be accessed at this link which is given on this slide and from tomorrow you will uh, see the units one to three online uh, we will put the units number four and five online later on uh, in two weeks so the idea is that uh, all the participants um, so you as you see the webinar now you can dive a little bit deeper into these um, topics and um, you will also have the same learning speed so uh, there's a forum that you can access where you can discuss and uh, exchange some questions and experience uh, and uh, so this will be available for the units one to three already by tomorrow and then we uh, can subsequently upload the other uh, units four and five then in two weeks of time um, the units two to four will be concluded by some tasks to strengthen and validate the knowledge uh, and we also aim to uh, issue digital badges um, upon successful completion of the course uh, and we the Wuppertal Institute also plan to content uh, to update the content on a regular basis to, to keep up with new developments uh, so obviously the moderation will last until 27th of June, but it will, the e-learning course itself will stay online afterwards as a leg uh, legacy of the Suits project. Um, and uh, yeah, if there is, for example, a new EU reform on public procurement, uh, we can update then the e-learning e course, but it won't be moderated then after 27th of July. Okay, some logistics, if you like. Um, we have prepared um, three presentations as mentioned so they will last uh, 50 minutes each we won't um, let you ask questions after each presentation but we have uh, planned a long time after uh, uh, we have heard all those three presentations and then you can ask questions and we will uh, try to answer them so there's two possibilities to ask questions uh, the first is to raise your hand on the um, tool which um, should be visible, the, the, the panel, uh, go to webinar panel, so you can raise your hand and um, then we can unmute you and you, you can ask a question. The possible possibility number two is just type in the question and send it over to me. I will uh, then collect all the questions which we receive and I can uh, then read them and ask the respective presenter to which this question is directed to and uh, he or she will then try to answer this question. So these two possibilities exist. If there is any question that uh, comes up already now during the presentation, maybe it is better to just type it in, but you can also uh, raise your hand and wait. All right, so that's the introduction. Longer than expected due to some technical problems um so i will now hand over to to alexei uh hello everybody i hope you can see my screen uh, thank you first for introduction once again i am alexei Lugovoy from uh, arcadis and um, we were responsible for developing um, guidelines to innovative financing as part of the suits project so we work closely together with uh, our partner cities to develop the guidelines which are both useful and uh, user friendly so we got feedback from our partner cities that what what they need and uh, we assume by extension local authorities and small and medium cities need are something concise which is straight to the point with the case studies and best practices and um, specific implementation steps so that's what we try to deliver if you succeeded or not you'd be the judges so first of all why innovative financing approaches are important and needed so 
there is an increasing pressure on services provided by cities due to population growth and urbanization. At the same time, largely as a result of the financial crisis, uh, local governments uh, have seen their budgets reduced over the past de decade. And there is a reduced availability of both public and private financing specifically for infrastructure projects and more specifically for sustainable mobility and infrastructure projects. So at the same time, uh, cities become more and more responsible to fund and operate mobility infrastructure on, on their own. And uh, that's where innovative financing approaches and uh, instruments could be useful as they can be used to fill the gap in financing and uh, to raise additional revenue for sustainable mobility projects. So the, the objective of the guidelines are stem from what I just said. So it, it is to identify and present existing and innovative financing mechanisms and um, to expose any gaps in current knowledge and organizational capacity of small and medium cities and uh, to present these mechanisms which are scalable and transferable to sustainable mobility projects in small and medium cities. And then there is an overarching goal of, uh, of uh, the SUITS project is to enhance the administrative and organizational capacity of local authorities in these cities. So the main outputs of the guidelines, as we see it, is this matrix of financing mechanisms and uh, the short briefs of innovative financing instruments we have prepared with help from, uh, from SUITS partners. So a little bit, I, I, I will talk of, about the matrix and the briefs in more details a little bit later. So the, the target audience, as we see it, is quite broad. And uh, it includes policymakers and uh, local authority staff, transport planning practitioners, local community groups, and as well as local businesses and developers, research organizations, and our partners from Civitas and SAMP as well as media and uh, wider public and uh, hopefully on this webinar we have representatives from if not all of these groups but from most of them so this is the the structure of the guidelines just to give you an idea so so introduction which outlines how to use the guidelines best and uh, there are also section on on the research methodology and then a section which provides uh, uh, the context uh, regulatory and environmental uh, and governance uh, uh, context within the eu selective uh, eu member states and as well as uh, present-day trends in funding for urban transport and mobility in cities so then there's section why innovative financing approaches are important and, and, and their principles. And okay, just briefly like, about the principles. So it, it's, we identify like six, six principles, like environmental sustainability, that mechanism could be used to support investment towards low carbon and uh, climate resilient transport and mobility. It's financial sustainability that uh, this mechanism does not have negative impact on the uh, ability of small and medium cities to cooperate with other public bodies or private organizations to attract uh, funding from, from these sources. Complementarity, that the mechanism could be used with other financing mechanisms, yeah. And uh, scalability, that uh, the mechanism could be replicated and scaled up in other cities uh, in, in the EU. Efficacy that uh, the mechanism can uh, breach uh, finding shortfalls and to create new funding streams and finally innovation that it uh, features some new and innovative methods uh, which are not widely used across the eu so the next se se section is the, the financing mechanisms themselves which we present in form of uh, summaries in, in the report and then uh, as uh, extended briefs in the appendices and then the section on recommendation and conclusion and uh, references and links because again we didn't want to create a bloated and massive guidelines with too much information so the references and links section provides readers who would like to know to learn more uh, with with online resources they can use so how 
to make the best out of the, the best use of the guidelines. So, so this is like a broad roadmap. So the, the local authority or organization which wants to to implement sustainable mobility, mobility project, identify these projects and then uses um, matrix uh, to identify potential financing instruments which can be used to fund uh, the, this uh, mobility project. Then uh, whoever is uh, reading the guidelines and trying implementing the, the, the projects have to read the summaries of relevant financing mechanism to get more idea if the mechanism is, is applicable if uh, if it is applicable for a specific uh, local context so the, there is an option to read the extended brief of the financing instrument again if uh, if it still seems like a applicable uh, in, uh, instrument uh, the local authority staff can use the references and link to learn more about uh, the mechanism and how to implement it and then follow these recommendations and uh, implementation step steps to develop strategy how this mechanism can be used to to raise additional revenue and then finally uh, use this mechanism and instruments to deliver sustainable mobility and, and transportation projects so this is the uh, the, the idea how to use it. So this is the matrix of financing mechanism we created. So it's it's pretty straightforward. So on top you have financing mechanisms and uh, on, on the side, sustainable transport and mobility measures which need, need it uh, to be funded. So by cross reference is these two categories you can find what financial instruments are applicable for for this specific type of projects okay so the list is uh not exhaustive and uh it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be taken as a as, a, as written in stone so it it's it just a guideline and just to to help local authorities to identify uh, appropriate financing mechanisms and to limit potential financing mechanisms just to, to, to narrow it down to something more specific. And then uh, the, the briefs themselves, uh, so they have, uh, depending on the complexity of the, of, the, of the instrument, it's between like five and maybe 15 pages and have three distinct parts, which is like background information and description, uh, identifying potential benefit and benefits and attractiveness on the financing mechanisms, challenges and risks and uh, the, the track record. So there are a section on case studies and uh, best practice examples, which we thought would be useful for to see how it's been done by other cities to, to, to raise revenue. And then the, probably the most relevant section is uh, guidelines for implementations, how small and medium cities, local authorities can use this mechanism to, to how can they implement it by following these steps. Again, depending on the mechanism, it can be either that some broad ideas or specific step-by-step -step guides, how to implement it. So we identify 21 innovative financing mechanisms. So again, innovative is, it's a broad, in a, in a broad sense here. So it's, uh, it follows from uh, selling naming rights and uh, municipal green bonds to donations as part of consumer purchases and citizen cooperatives and workplace parking levies. So again, it's uh, some of them are very, uh, uh, not very, but relatively complex, such as uh, and, and require ex expertise, sometimes outside expertise, such as uh, municipal green bonds and uh, and uh, emission trading. But some of them are much more straightforward and uh, manageable, even for local authority staff themselves, such as uh, selling advertising and uh, encouraging civic crowdfunding. So just to give you an example, I will briefly talk about uh, one of the fin financing mechanisms mechanism we identified, which is a workplace parking levy. So it's, uh, 
it's not widely used across the EU. So it's uh, it's used in Australia, in, in, in a few cities, in, in Perth and in Sydney and Melbourne. It's also used in Singapore and um, it's used in the UK, but only in one city, which, uh, which I will talk later about. So the key characteristics of this mechanism is that uh, it's, uh, it aims to reduce daily car travel by, by encouraging uh, the removal of workplace parking. So it's, uh, it's charged on certain uh, workplace parking spaces used by commuter, but it, charge, it is charged on employee, employers and not on their employees. So the, and the proceeds from, the, from this levy uh, collected by the local authority must be spent on transport improvement and investment. So certain vehicles can be exempt, and uh, such as uh, ambulances and emergency services, and as well as uh, parking for disabled um, could be entitled to discount. And uh, once established, the system is fairly cheap and easy to manage. So attractiveness of these mechanisms are relatively many. So there is um, there is a fact that it can be uh, a substantial source of additional revenue for for a city, and for the, and this revenue can be invested in uh, transport and mobility improvements, specifically sustainable transport and mobility improvements and uh, public transport. So because it's charged on uh, on employer and not uh, and not motorists, it can be a little bit easy to introduce because there is no direct conflict between local authority and the public. So it's, it encourages model shift and uh, decrease in vehicle usage within the boundary and uh, provides financial incentives uh, to reduce demand for additional workplace parking. And uh, it can it can contribute to reduction in congestion, and uh, more importantly, it uh, provides a tool for internalization of some of the externalities caused through commuting to work by car. Uh, and again, once established, the system could be managed relatively cheaply and easily. So there are also risks, obviously, and. Uh, it uh, could lead to potential backlash from local businesses who would be charged extra. And uh, they, to avoid this, they need to know what are the benefits from this extra charge. So the local authority, which will consider introducing it, would need to communicate these potential benefits for local businesses. So it could be perceived as unfair because it uh, does not distinguish between people who travel in, in a peak peak hours and which is a congested period and those who do not. It also does not distinguish between uh, uh, people who have public transport, uh, public transport options and those, those who do not. And it also can be seen as uh, putting an additional burden on uh, low income uh, population. So the introduction of levy could take a long time as you will see from from the example from Nottingham, and it would require a lengthy and comprehensive consultation with local residents and businesses. It would also require the audit of all the existing workplace parking spaces, which can be a lengthy process. The finding the right balance between uh, pricing strategy for pricing strategy can be difficult because uh, there need to be a balance between revenue raising incentive uh, activity and um, while avoiding uh, setting a charge which is too high and to deter employers from setting up new businesses. So this is again going down to like the businesses will be afraid that it uh, will add additional cost to, to, to their operation and they can be reluctant to, to set up a new businesses. This is one of the major arguments against this, uh, uh, this mechanism. So there's also a risk of spilling over into, into the street parking if there is no existing uh, uh, parking control measures on the street. So if you just start charging people for parking at their work, they will try to park on the street, obviously, unless you start charging for street parking as well. So in, briefly, the case study of Nottingham. So I'm not gonna go through this in details, but just 
to show you how long it took like so from when the local authorities started started considering introduction of the workplace parking levy in 2000 and when the scheme actually began in 2012 it, it passed 12 years it took 12 years to introduce the scheme which required a lot of effort on the, on the local authorities part but at the same time the, the benefits from workplace parking levy in nottingham are numerous and include uh, 44 million pounds uh, of revenue raised uh, from 2012 and this revenue was used to fund uh, tram extension and uh, railway station upgrade and bus subsidy and uh, green buses and uh, business travel plans so there is a 100% compliance of liable, liable employers. Again, that's probably cultural because it, 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 it could be less like in, in other countries, but in Britain with the, when businesses will face the big fines if they don't comply, they, they, they tend to comply with the, with the regulations. They also, the fact that the, the 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 administrative cost and the cost of management of the scheme is less than five percent of the revenue once the scheme was established, so it's so the rest of the money can be spent on the public transport improvement. Uh, there is reduced congestion, improved land use, and uh, benefits for urban regeneration. So the scheme is considered to be a success by by. By, by a lot of uh, independent observers, and there, there, there's a number of towns in the, in the UK, such as Oxford and Cambridge, are now considering introducing their own scheme. But again, that will take a while because uh, they need to consult uh, their population and, and, lo and local businesses. So I think that's it from me. Uh, yes, please subscribe to, uh, to an e learning course and um, you can find guidelines, draft version, and the briefs themselves on the, on the e-learning website. Please send your question to questions to Fred, and uh, we will try to answer answer them at the end of the of the three presentations. Thank you, and I will transfer now to to my colleague. I'm Jana Durska from Aeroplace, and um, uh, I'm going to introduce you right now to the. Uh, developing of bankable projects, new business models, and partnerships guidelines. Um, so uh, this was the task that was elaborated during the last uh, months uh, of this uh, project together with the city partners and academics. So we provided the research on, on these uh, three topics that are really related one to each other uh, in order to um, to transfer our knowledge to the local authorities of the small and medium uh, cities in order to uh, enhance their capacity of building uh, uh, bankable projects uh, and creating new business models and identifying the successful uh, partnerships. So what are the aims of these uh, guidelines? As I already said, we wanted to give the tool that will help the, um, the uh, urban mobility stakeholders to identify the best uh, uh, urban mobility solutions for their cities uh, and uh, to identify the new uh, partnership schemes in this field in order to prepare the, uh, the bankable uh, projects. So this is what exactly we did. We identified the business strategies, uh, new forms of partnerships, and uh, we also provided uh, some guidelines for the bankable projects documents that are going to be uh, the feasibility studies that I will introduce later on. So as Alexei already said, um, we have a broad, um, let's say, target of uh, our guidelines. It can be local authorities of small and medium-sized cities, it's a policy makers, it's research and development organization, it also can be the technology developers, for example. So this is the structure of the guidelines that uh, we uh, provided. As you can see, uh, we started from the uh, urban mobility trends to see what is actually going on right now in the urban mobility uh, stage. And we found out uh, these three main trends as a mobility as a service, integrated mobility and shared mobility as the main uh, components of the new urban um, mobility sector. As you know, that the, as the world is getting more technological and digitalized, uh, the old mobility uh, business model schemes are not 
working anymore or at least not that good. So we need a shift to the new business models. Then we provided the innovative forms of partnerships, starting from the uh, public-private partnership as the one of the, um, let's say, important tool for carrying out the transport and mobility projects. And we provided some uh, research in order to see how actually um, this public-private partnership can be brought and what other partnerships can be um, can exist in order to uh, help um, local authorities to create um, the alliance and uh, and the projects. Then we pass to the innovative business models, and here, as you can see, uh, uh, we choose as as the approach of uh, describing the business models, which is the business model canvas that I'm going to introduce later on. And then we briefly introduce the innovative uh, business models that we identify in, uh, during our research. At the end of the document, uh, you may find the, um, how to prepare the bankable projects, uh, in particular the feasibility studies uh, and the important aspects of the project management that I'm going to introduce. And the, probably the one of the important, uh, the most important part of this document is the business model briefs that we described uh, using the business model canvas that I'm going to describe later on. So uh, in order forms of partnerships, uh, we identified the uh, IPPP, as you can see. So what is it actually about? Uh, this form of partnership where still the public and private organizations taking the main, uh, the main stage, however, they can also include the, some other types of organizations, uh, such as uh, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, or for example, the communities which um, can participate in the alliance uh, in the project. So why actually choose this, uh, this other types of organization? So what are the benefits of the innovative public-private partnership? So this kind of organization can address uh, marketing needs and uh, tendencies better as, as they can be exactly the users of this, uh, of this mobility um, situation and the services. They can also transfer the institutional knowledge to the public and private organization. They can help to create the awareness of the services to, to the public and private organization and uh, can help to elaborate some social standards and uh, clarification schemes. So we also provided some recommendations in our guidelines. So you can see them on this screen right now. So uh, if you want to create a successful IPP, so we uh, suggest to choose um, uh, the, uh, for example, civil society organization or non-governmental organization that has a well-known uh, reputation in the mobility on, or transport sector. So they are very trustworthy and the uh, end users are going to trust, to trust them if they're saying that the service is really good. So also uh, they should allocate uh, uh, some resources, for, for instance, the human resources in order to, uh, to provide the, the work. And they can help uh, to erase uh, the campaign of the, of the services, as I said already, so they should have some kind of skills in order to do that. Um, so uh, another type of uh, innovative forms of partnership is research and development partnership, which actually includes, uh, it can be public and private partnership plus research and development uh, organization, or it can be, for example, public organization plus research and development or private uh, company that's using the, also the research and development uh, organizational uh, knowledge. So you can see that it can be universities or, for example, institutions or research companies um, that have a strong, actually, research and development departments, and they can help uh, the alliance to build um, an innovative uh, business model, um, uh, business models. So what are the benefits in order to include, actually, the research and development partners uh, in the alliance? They can help to, um, to produce the, the service or to improve it or to innovate it somehow, the operations of the, of the service. It can also, uh, it uh, helps to uh, allocate better the cost and, re uh, and risks uh, of, the, of the resources. And um, research and development partners, uh, partners can also help to assess the market 
not only from the point of view of the market needs, but also from the technological um, perspective. So what are the recommendations that we are giving in, uh, in this case? So again, it should be a leading organization in, in this sector. So uh, it's, it's pretty reliable and have enough uh, experience in order to, to actually to help to develop these services. It should help the a good technological and equipment level uh, so uh, it's it's using actually the current uh, technologies in order to provide the services. Um, it is also very important to establish the intellectual property rights. So all the um, all the partners of the consortium of the alliance knows uh, what are their rights uh, for the innovation um, and what they can expect. So as I already said, moving to the business models, we use the business model canvas approach in order to describe our briefs that we have identified during our research. And for those who, who is not actually um, aware of, of this approach, the business model canvas is a useful tool in order to give the, the future entrepreneur or the company that wants to develop um, the innovative uh, services, the general idea of the business. As you can see, the business model canvas has nine main building blocks that helps you to understand uh, what our value proposition, like what we're, uh, what the company is developing, what problems uh, is solving, who are the customers that they are going to address the services, what kind of the relationship uh, uh, the company wants to establish with the customers, uh, what the activities um, and key partners should be involved uh, in the project in order to um, make the project a successful story. Uh, what kind of resources uh, the company needs uh, in order to uh, develop and maintain the services or product. What channels uh, the company wants to use in order to, uh, to sell the product or service. And what are the revenues and the costs of the, uh, of the future um, business. So these are the main uh, uh, urban mobility uh, services that we are uh, identified during our research. So as you can see, we are dealing here with the car on demand services, micro mobility, car sharing, ride sharing, bike sharing, uh, innovative parking solutions, innovative sustainable public transport and integrated mobility. All this um, briefs can be uh, uh, find at the end of the guidelines so actually the stakeholders of uh, mobility sector can um, can have the idea uh, how to uh, how to develop this business or at least to compare actually if they're already doing that we also provided some uh, key aspects for the implementation of these uh, innovative services in this case uh, now you can see the um, implementation of smart payment and e-ticketing. For example, here we give an example of the cost that uh, the organization or actually partnership can, uh, can face, such as a software development, control system, back office system, operational stuff, and so on. Also, you can see uh, who can be involved uh, in the project as a stakeholders. For example, in this case, we have local and regional authorities, public transport operators, financing institutions, and so on, and types of investment that you can um, actually uh, look for in order to uh, finance uh, the project. For example, the pu public funding, that can be private funding, public-private partnership, sponsorship and advertising, EU funding, and more of these uh, instruments of funding you can find in the guidelines that Alexei just uh, has uh, presented before. So we also give some guidelines for the implementation that you can find in this table, like selection of suitable investment mechanisms, selection of software development, local authorities should give a hand actually to, pro uh, to project and design uh, these services and to implement it and so on. So uh, the third topic that we addressed in our guidelines was the how to prepare actually the bankable project. So when at the end you have the, your business idea, you know what exactly you want to the, the company wants to to produce, what kind of uh, problems uh, exist uh, in the city, and what partners you, uh, the company wants to involve. 
uh, in the project, uh, then you can pass to, to this uh, topic in order to see how the, um, this project can be seen as bankable. So this is a very important part uh, uh, at the end because uh, this is exactly what's going to, to give the idea to the investors if the project is viable and worth to invest in. So uh, as you can see in this slide, we're dealing with feasibility studies, which is a document that consists of the different feasibility studies fields, as you can see. So it starts with the, um, some introduction, so executive summaries that give some general idea of the project. And then uh, afterwards, uh, one by one, you're describing different feasibility studies, as for example, uh, we provided some guidelines here uh, that talks about the product and service feasibility, so describes what product uh, or service the um, organization is going to provide, what technical or technological feasibility is going to be addressed, uh, like if the project is technologically uh, can support this, uh, uh, these services, or it, uh, is the organization going to outsource the technology or it going to produce the, uh, the services inside their, uh, the consortium. So industry, industry and market analysis is very important because here you, you will show the investor or the bank uh, what is the market uh, the project is addressing. Is it mature enough or is something new? Uh, what are the competitors that existing there? Are the users are willing actually to pay for the, for the services? Then uh, there's also, for example, the, the probably the most important one, the economic feasibility studies that it is going to show is actually the project is viable or not, because uh, the investor is going to analyze this, uh, this feasibility field very carefully to see what are the, the benefits that the project can bring, not only from the monetary perspective, but also like from the non-monetarized one. Uh, and uh, here, uh, the very important step is to provide the cost-benefit analysis and the, the benefits should overcome the costs, of course, in order to be viable. So also the financial feasibility analysis is important in order to give uh, the whole, uh, let's say, image of the, of the request, like uh, the amount request for the, for the project. If there are, if there are other uh, investors already involved or gonna be involved, what is the payback period? Uh, what is the ex uh, exit strategy for the investor? What's the investment terms and expectations? Uh, so this is gonna be uh, described in the financial feasibility field. And you can see that there are some other uh, feasibility fees that uh, described over here, like operational one, the organizational that is talking about the the team actually that is going to work on the project and their skills. The intellectual property, as I already mentioned, is also very important to address um, from the beginning. The legal feasibility study that it shows that actually the project is not gonna be uh, in conflict with the um, legal uh, system of your uh, country, city or region. The risk analysis is also should be done in order to provide uh, like all the risk that the project can um, can face in the future. It can be some uh, business risks or uh, political risks uh, and so on. Schedule feasibility is also important, so you can show actually to the investor uh, how the whole project is going to be developed and what is the schedule for that. And the non-financial impacts also can be. Um, can be provided in order to see what actually benefits the projects can uh, can bring to the city some for example some social uh, impact or some um, uh, let's say not something non-financial we also provided some um, uh, some suggestions like of course uh, you can add some some other sections if you want so the the document should be reader friendly and uh, there is no really restriction, but it shouldn't be like uh, really, really long. So from 10 to 20 pages and um, it should be prepared pre pretty well in order to really uh, obtain the, uh, the finances. So the document that we provided, the guidelines actually uh, concludes with some recommendations uh, that we bring to each three topics in order to uh, done it successfully. For example, you can see from the new forms of partnerships, 
it is very important to have the integrated approach of financial, technical, and business planning, for example, and to have a good management system uh, through the project agreements. In the innovative business models, as you can see, we suggest to monitor uh, the constant monitoring of the market tendencies and technological innovation in order to be all the time, um, let's say, informed what is going on uh, in the urban mobility sector. And of course, the top-down approach is very important that the management should support and provide the resources. That actually what we find out uh, during the project and talking with the city partners of our project, that many times we were uh, said that actually local authorities are lacking the human resources in order to, um, to develop uh, the new uh, services or projects. And of course, for the bankable projects, we're um, suggesting to Again, they allocate the human resources in order to develop the documents and to be sure you know, that all the feasibility studies are included. So, as I already said, we have uh, created the, the briefs of the innovative um, ser urban services, urban mobility services. Uh, and the, right now you can see on the screen the example of the brief that they're talking about, the e-ticketing and smart payment. So in, uh, in this brief, we are giving the definition what is it actually the service is about. Like you can see, it's the technology that uh, provide the integration of services that permit uh, the traveler to pay by means of apps, smart cards, smart wallets, and so on. And we give some main concept of the, of the services, like, um, for example, post payment process and pay as you go. Um, that helps to provide the calculation and estimate the price. Uh, this is the internet uh, enabled uh, technology and so on. So you can also see the benefits uh, for the stakeholders in order to implement the e-ticketing system that we provided the example, for example, for the public transport operators, it can be, um, it can help to reduce the administrative cost. It can help to control or to reduce the frauds and the fair evasion as we're talking about uh, the digitalized ways of payment. And um, for example, for local and regional authorities, uh, they can benefit from creating a positive economic uh, climate for the companies uh, and increase, of course, the public transport use. And for the users, uh, I think it's evident that the system can permit um, to use better the public transportation by using the electronic wallet uh, or prepayment systems. And I, as I already said, we use the business model canvas in order to give the mobility stakeholders the, uh, the whole uh, image of the, um, uh, of the project, how it's gonna be. Of course, uh, I wanted to say in advance that this is not like a written rules. I mean, if you're taking this uh, business model canvas and applied it, that uh, the project will, uh, will go well because you, you should have uh, in your mind the, the different, let's say, economic situation of your country or of your city, the different political situation. So uh, these uh, ideas should be applied to your real situation of your cities and uh, your uh, mobility and transport situation. So as I already said, here you, we have the business model canvas of e-ticketing and smart payment. And here you can see what are the key partners, for example, that are involved, and we are mentioned before uh, some of them. What are the key activities, for example? It's a public transport planning, fair and uh, compensation policy planning, uh, designing of e-ticketing system um, architecture, and so on. Uh, we also have some, uh, who are the customers, for example, of these services is public transport users, it's occasional users, for example, um, subscription-based users, uh, companies paying for their employees, and so on. So what are the customer relationships that uh, the organization want to, to construct uh, by providing this? It's a self-service or automated services or personal assistance, for example, the resources that are needed for uh, development and, um, and man maintaining uh, are the distribution channels, for example, uh, or the fair media or onboard validation equipment uh, or a core ticketing system and back office. Um, the channels that uh, are going to be used in order to, um, to sell these uh, services is web sales or sale, uh, sales points. 
And of course, we are giving also the, uh, the examples of cost structure and the revenue streams uh, here in the business model canvas. So as I already said, the mobility stakeholders can uh, benefit from this brief uh, if, for example, they want to create this kind of service and they don't mm, do not have the idea how to do that, so they can have something in front of the eyes and see at least the suggestions that we are providing. Or, for example, if they already have uh, this kind of service to compare actually with the, our brief that we have uh, introduced here. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have some other um, uh, some some questions or you want to deeper uh, it somehow so you can write me uh, directly to Jana Dulska at aeroclays.com I'm going to be glad to answer for your to your emails and of course write down your questions if you have right now uh, on the chat so we're gonna um, read them after the last speaker gonna finish the presentation and please do not forget to subscribe for our e-learning courses uh, that you can see on the bottom of the uh, of this uh, presentation. Thank you again, uh, um, Fred, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to my colleagues for uh, their uh, lectures. Uh, I shall um, enter uh, in the next minutes uh, in the details regarding uh, innovative procurement uh, procedures and uh, processes. Uh, as you can um, could hear from um, my uh, previous uh, speakers, um, we uh, have looked uh, during our uh, research uh, for uh, how to assist uh, public authorities in uh, finding uh, financing, uh, financial tools and also how to organize their ideas. But uh, uh, in the end, uh, all of this uh, should be turned in um, public acquisition systems. So, um, Innovative uh, procurement uh, will help you to um, um, put uh, all the ideas on the table. Uh, in my uh, brief presentation, uh, based on the guideline that we have developed uh, during the past uh, months, uh, I shall um, uh, pass through um, uh, a short definition of what we understand uh, by innovative procurement. Uh, a short presentation of uh, our guidelines, uh, why we started this uh, research, um, and um, then the goals regarding modernization of uh, public administrations and services, and uh, we shall uh, touch some um, uh, details uh, that uh, came up uh, from our uh, research. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, uh, of course, some um, conclusions that we have uh, reached uh, up to this moment. So when we talk about uh, innovative uh, procurement, uh, we should not uh, think about um, uh, ways to uh, skip the law, but by the contrary, we uh, are looking to um, um, ideas where uh, the public, ref uh, public reform uh, of uh, public procurement uh, that was started in uh, Europe uh, a few years ago and uh, put in law uh, in uh, 2014 uh, should come uh, in effect and uh, provide efficiency to uh, the community. Uh, we uh, should uh, consider um, innovative um, solutions uh, to help us reach the best uh, uh, services uh, for the money. And uh, we should, have, uh, should bear in our mind that uh, innovation uh, in reality depends on the creativity and the competency uh, each public authority um, can, um, can provide. Uh, we um, are developing a guideline uh, inside the Suites project. Uh, this guideline uh, will be uh, made available uh, for you after this um, uh, session and uh, together with the, the two other uh, guidelines. Uh, they are now at the stage of um, draft uh, projects and um, we are still uh, evaluating them, so we, we need uh, your uh, feedback. But um, briefly, uh, in our guideline, we uh, looked 
uh, how to enhance uh, local uh, authorities' um, administrative capacity to um, uh, develop um, their competency in uh, the area of acquisition. Uh, the area, uh, the business area we are uh, touching is mainly public transport and uh, subsequent ideas like congestion, emission, uh, uh, consumption, etc. Um, and uh, we uh, have uh, uh, started this uh, research because, in general, public transport, uh, public procurement means a lot of uh, money um, where uh, uh, due to um, some procedures uh, money are uh, are lost and uh, eu directives uh, from 2014 uh, are looking in this direction so uh, just to have a, a brief uh, element uh, we, uh, here you can see um, a comparative uh, image on how uh, different countries in Europe uh, are uh, using, uh, let's call it uh, economic efficiency versus uh, lowest uh, price. And uh, we see that only a handful of countries uh, like um, uh, Ireland, uh, France, and UK um, go uh, more uh, more than ten percent of their uh, of uh, processes are not bound to um, lowest price. Okay, uh, just a minute. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, in uh, Europe, uh, you are all aware that uh, there is a process of uh, reforming the public procurement uh, area, uh, and uh, mainly we uh, see uh, five uh, different areas uh, att attached by uh, the new legal si uh, system. One uh, goes towards increasing efficiency, and for this, um, Europe um, asks for uh, electronic uh, systems uh, like uh, the electronic certificate or uh, ele uh, electronic uh, documents for uh, proving uh, the quality of uh, the supplier. Uh, also, um, uh, there is a huge uh, pressure on um, increasing the participation of, of uh, smaller and uh, medium enterprises. And for this, uh, the new legal system asks for a, a simplified uh, uh, tool, uh, system of requirements. Also, uh, we should switch for online procurement systems and uh, nonetheless uh, division of contracts into lots so uh, smaller uh, companies can access uh, uh, the acquisition process. Uh, we are looking for uh, creating a culture of integrity and uh, fair play. And for these um, new measures of uh, transparency and anti-corruption should be uh, installed. Um, also, uh, there are new rules uh, about uh, how to modify uh, the contract uh, after uh, awarding process and um, a new monitoring uh, system uh, where uh, uh, member states should uh, provide every three year uh, report on um, the public procurement uh, system in their country. Um, a very important uh, area of this reform is uh, the societal uh, challenges. Uh, new um, uh, approach in how to deal with uh, um, the um, environment but also with uh, social uh, challenges uh, to create uh, advantages to social um, disadvantaged groups to disabled people 
and uh, to um, look in uh, life cycle cost uh, of the products we buy. Um, as we are uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, promoting a single market uh, is a key element of the uh, reform and accessing uh, other uh, uh, EU markets is uh, mandatory in um, uh, the process. So, when we talk uh, about uh, modernization of um, public uh, administrations, um, we should uh, consider um, uh, simplified um, regulations to provide uh, more competitive uh, procedures in um, negotiation. So, uh, we should uh, change from um, the classic uh, type of uh, acquisition when um, the supplier provides a fixed uh, uh, pro a proposal to uh, something more uh, complex and um, also open to um, uh, negotiation and updating the uh, initial documents. Uh, this is applied mainly to um, innovation, innovative uh, partnerships. Uh, so, um, a negotiation of the goals um, can um, bring uh, new ideas uh, in um, uh, the acquisition. Uh, and the cities and the other uh, local authorities uh, should look in uh, innovation uh, partnerships uh, and uh, public procurement of innovative uh, solutions. Again, um, authorities should uh, enhance uh, um, the competition through uh, new uh, rules about uh, concession. Uh, this will uh, provide uh, uh, the suppliers uh, possibility to return uh, their investment uh, in um, longer term um, uh, projects. In um, areas like uh, uh, transport, um, it is necessary to identify solutions to have uh, more flexible um, uh, rules. Um, because uh, as we are talking here about uh, complex uh, systems, uh, it is sometimes uh, difficult to foresee from the beginning all uh, aspects or technical uh, requirements uh, that uh, the supplier can um, uh, ans uh, can answer to. So uh, we. Um, started to assess um, uh, how we can um, improve the procurement uh, sector and uh, uh, we have identified five uh, areas where um, the award criteria should be uh, improved. So um, when we develop the acquisition documents, we should look in um, solutions, how to uh, ask for lower pollution, uh, to uh, optimize uh, energy consumption, uh, how to deal with external cost, how to deal with um, uh, the cost over the <coughs> entire uh, lifetime of the product, and uh, nonetheless uh, to identify uh, local uh, criteria. Uh, that uh, will uh, personalize uh, the system, the uh, products to the local requirement. For example, uh, we have looked in our uh, research in um, one uh, delicate uh, topic, uh, uh, that of uh, life cycle cost. Um, when uh, we develop uh, uh, an acquisition around the life cycle cost, uh, the uh, the complexity is uh, much higher, but also the the return. 
Uh, starting with 2009, uh, there is a, a, di a European directive asking for uh, uh, using such criteria in your uh, uh, acquisition uh, processes. And we uh, should keep in mind that, uh, in general, the acquisition price is only a small percentage of the total cost that uh, a system can um, uh, impose to the acquisitor uh, during the life cycle uh, time. So, for example, um, we looked in um, a product dedicated to um, um, railway uh, passenger transport, uh, so public transport by uh, rail, where the locomotive um, represent uh, only 22% uh, uh, when we buy it, and the rest about um, 88, uh, uh, 78, uh, sorry, 78% uh, uh, of the costs come during the life cycle um, period. Uh, the same uh, we can see in um, the electric bus uh, market, uh, market that is still uh, young and where the acquisition price can uh, uh, go lower. Uh, so. Today we see somewhere around 40% the acquisition price and the 60% uh, the cost over the life cycle time. Um, what uh, we can understand from here is that the moment we look in the cost over the um, um, utilization um, period, we may uh, save uh, more substantial uh, money uh, as compared only to uh, saving some money in the acquisition uh, price. Uh, we need to keep in mind again that uh, this is not an easy um, process. Uh, life cycle cost uh, invo involves uh, a lot of um, analysis for the subsystems involved uh, in the system that uh, we are about to um, to buy, so um, uh, it is very important to uh, have a cooperation with um, uh, the market, with um, su uh, main suppliers of systems and subsystems, to identify uh, the key elements of uh, of a product. Uh, as you can see in uh, the table uh, that uh, we have prepared uh, for. Um, um, a diesel um, a train uh, for suburban uh, uh, services. Um, we um, have maybe more than 20 uh, different uh, um, indicators that uh, we should uh, we should evaluate. But the moment we uh, do this um, calculation. Um, the uh, savings over 10, uh, 20 years uh, can be again uh, substantial. Another area where we can improve our uh, procurement system is looking in the external um, uh, costs of the transport. Uh, so we have to remember that um, transport activities uh, have uh, a substantial uh, impact over environment. Um, not only uh, by uh, chemical uh, pollution, but also by uh, land use, by uh, accidents um, and um, uh, congestion or uh, delays that uh, we can uh, see. So um, uh, some, uh, some of the evaluations say that uh, more than 500 billion uh, euro uh, are lost every year due to this uh, overall uh, uh, transport costs in um, uh, Europe and uh, economic, uh, European economic space. Um, and uh, out of this, uh, 460 uh, billion euros, so more than 90% of these external costs are lost through uh, road transport uh, services. Uh, for example, 
um, when I look in um, uh, the situation of some uh, cities from Europe, we see uh, how uh, these external costs uh, can help uh, the city. Uh, Bucharest, Vienna and Prague, uh, three um, capital cities from um, uh, Central uh, Europe uh, with a comparable uh, population. Uh, but uh, as we can see, um, the, uh, the number of uh, cars or the share of cars uh, in uh, Vienna and Prague are uh, about 60% compared to, uh, to Bucharest. And uh, this may be explained also uh, through um, a long history of um, having acquisition with uh, public transport uh, encouragement in mind. Um, so, when we talk about uh, procedures, um, we uh, may uh, select from uh, the six major types of procedure from open procedure to um, uh, negotiation without uh, prior uh, notice. Um, the point is um, every uh, type of um, uh, procurement procedures uh, give uh, to the public authority uh, an opportunity to improve uh, the um, documents they have presented in um, uh, their uh, official acquisition um, uh, process and to um, um, be uh, closer to their goals in um, uh, reaching innovation in uh, public transport in our uh, case or in mobility in general. As I said in the beginning, uh, Procurement uh, is closely linked to um, financing and also to um, um, developing the so-called business plans, the uh, working plans. Uh, we can see some um, ideas where um, we can mix uh, uh, different tools. So, um, for example, we have uh, now um, one uh, system that is called pre-commercial procurement uh, where uh, um, research and development uh, is uh, encouraged and uh, uh, through this uh, system um, you may uh, get some 90% uh, uh, of direct expensive uh, refunded by uh, EU uh, uh, funds. Another uh, area uh, is called the uh, procurement of innovative uh, solutions, um, where uh, uh, we have uh, uh, challenges in um, our um, uh, urban areas. Uh, we may um, approach uh, uh, such a solution and uh, the suppliers uh, will uh, come um, by the uh, side of uh, the city and uh, develop uh, together with the city uh, the necessary products that um, uh, after the testing uh, period uh, will uh, be transformed in um, uh, products of mass consumption, let's call it. Yeah, so um, we may establish a partnership from the early stages of uh, an idea. Um, in um, Europe, uh, there are some activities of uh, um, to coordinate and to support uh, the first two um, uh, tools that I mentioned. And uh, for this, uh, you may uh, receive 100% uh, uh, co-financing uh, from EU funds. Uh, and um, I also want to remind you about the, uh, the role of um, research and innovation in the context of the um, um, EU uh, framework program. Uh, so only for example in Horizon 2020 we have um, for uh, this financial year 
more than 124 million uh, euro available for innovative uh, procurement. Um, based on um, our um, research and uh, through our uh, guideline, we uh, are looking in uh, how to uh, help uh, local authorities to develop their capacity, uh, administrative capacity in this, uh, in this field. Um, so um, we need to take in consideration that uh, procurement uh, area requires uh, expertise. So uh, the professionals in um, procurement departments need to be trained and uh, uh, they should have access to um, a new uh, interpretation of the laws and of the practice in um, uh, the area. Um, Stefan, can we hurry up a little bit because we're already yes, running out of time. Okay. Uh, I'm not touching more uh, this because uh, you'll be able to read the point. I'm uh, already uh, coming to uh, conclusions. So um, innovating in public uh, procurement is uh, very important and uh, should be done through uh, adequate uh, selection and training of the staff. We need to apply the reform in a creative um, way. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, the ideas in the guidelines uh, will help uh, you to do this. Um, what you've heard uh, up to now, uh, as Fred uh, mentioned in the beginning of our um, training session, uh, are part of a um, uh, research program uh, that will span uh, up to 2020. Um, we are developing these uh, three guidelines uh, that will be integrated in an uh, electronic tool um, uh, that will uh, make easier to public authorities to navigate between um, different uh, ideas. And uh, at this uh, moment, we have started a uh, uh, pilot application together with uh, one city from uh, Romania to evaluate uh, the and uh, to test the ideas uh, incorporated in the three guidelines. Um, so um, we um, hope that in the next uh, period uh, you will be able um, to provide us uh, feedback uh, about uh, what you shall read in um, the uh, documents so that. Uh, in uh, 2019, when we shall provide the final uh, version of the guidelines, we shall have um, ideas validated uh, by uh, the pilot project, but also by uh, the feedback came all over Europe. Uh, and uh, as my colleagues uh, already mentioned, I encourage you also to, uh, to go and to register to uh, the new e-learning course that uh, I put here the web door. Yeah. Thank you, Fred, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. Thank, thanks, Stefan, so much. That was very informative. Thank also Alexei and thank Jana for your presentations. We only have very few minutes left for questions, but um, so I will broadcast my screen. You can see my screen now. Um, just before we uh, go over to the questions, once one uh, some clicks on the website in your agenda uh, campus.org, which was already mentioned several times. So if you click here on the right hand side to suits, uh, you will be directed to this uh, page, and then uh, just click on the very bottom of the site. You click on um, on this field about public procurement and uh, innovative uh, financing mechanisms and business models. Here you can log in into the course. And if you're not registered, you have to register uh, beforehand. Uh, if this is your first time, then he create a new account. So this is what I wanted to show you. And now we go over to the questions. Uh, the first questions are directed to Alexei. Alexei, if you could unmute yourself. So there was um, one yeah. question about the workplace parking levy that you 
uh, that that you introduced. So, what percentage of the tram costs were covered by the workplace parking levy in Nottingham? Can you can you do you know those figures uh, from the from the uh, example that you presented? No, I don't have this number, and I I imagine that wouldn't be like a massive cost because uh, the light rail as trams are like is quite expensive, but it, it, it supplements some of the costs. And uh, the, 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 they need to be like some some other financing yeah. mechanisms which will contribute to the to the full cost. So yeah, it's def it's it's definitely not not that does not cover everything that needed, but it's a uh, it's a good uh, supplementary income. Okay, thank you so much. Next question uh, also directed to you: Were there many financing methods that you did not use in the metrics because they are not suitable for small and medium-sized cities? uh not not really we, I, I, we there there's there's some some of the mechanisms which are better suited for for larger cities like for example like um community infrastructure levy which is widely used uh, in the uk when the, the well the developers pay like a, uh, a certain levy per for example per square meter of, of the development and uh, and then this money I used for for funding uh, transport infrastructure, like for example, that's uh, like the, the project in London now, like one of the biggest uh, infrastructure projects in Europe. I think I think it's the biggest actually, like the Crossrail, the the new uh, underground uh, line uh, for London Tube was uh, to a large extent uh, funded as well through 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 this through these methods, but. It 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 it's, was applicable for 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 a large city because the, the property prices are affected dramatically by by good public infrastructure. So so that's what the the the, the, the city of London did. They tried to capture this uh, increase in property prices and the, the developers profit through charging um, charging developers uh, a, a certain levy, which is like a community infrastructure levy, but for smaller cities, that could be less effective because they are all like with with any levy or or fee, there there has to be a balance because uh, you don't want to discourage developers to investing into your city. At the same time, you want to to raise revenue. And so so yes, uh, so some of the mechanisms are more applicable for to to larger cities and for cities uh, with. Um, mm -hmm. Which already have a strong uh, attractiveness to the investors that that than, than other cities, but uh, we did not actively, I think, discourage any in any mechanisms because we thought uh, small and medium cities would need to be aware of this uh, of these mechanisms, which are used by big cities, and we try to find the way to for that for them to reuse them through our implementation steps, but it's also so small and medium cities could find their own way to to introduce them if they're aware. So no, we did not actually discourage anything. Okay, good. Um, and another question to you, uh, very specific. How can a municipality issue a municipal green bond? Um, the municipality, uh, the uh, no, not the municipality, the, the investor must have uh, incentives in order to invest. How to solve this problem? Is this something that you can? Uh, easily I'm, uh, I'm I'm glad you asked, but I I think I will refer you to the uh, municipal green bond brief yeah. and uh, the e-learning course because I think it would be better rather than than me like uh, mm -hmm. trying to get 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 in, in, in the, into the details of this. Yeah. I think that that's that that that's exactly why we created the e-learning course and created yeah. the brief. So yeah. whoever asked it, I encourage to read the briefs first, and then if you have any other questions, just uh, contact me directly or through Fred and uh, he'll give more examples or direction. Yeah, fantastic. That is the fantastic um, hint for me also to point to the fact that those briefs are uploaded, all of those briefs are uploaded on the e-learning platform um, for, for the uh, financing mechanisms as, as well as for the business models. And uh, as regards this uh, green bonds, we also have a video 
uh, which you can see if you register to the to the e-learning course. Thanks, Alexei. Um, uh, again, this is yeah. I think that that was what I mentioned exactly. And then about the public procurement, we also have, um, for example, the the Excel sheet that Stefan presented during his presentation. Uh, we are currently working on a little like, exercise that tries to. Um, yeah, that we try to build, like to show how uh, many different life cycle costs one has to, uh, one could uh, incorporate as a criterion, and how how that would change then the uh, calculation for the uh, for the municipality to procure the best uh, for the best bit, uh, to take the best bit. Um, anyway, I will hand over now to the questions uh, to to Jana. Um, so one question, uh, Jana, we had was uh, whether technology is a part of integrated mobility of the integrated mobility section. So uh, apps for integrating public transport and shared mobility, for planning, for ticket purchase, is that part of your um, of your guideline and part of uh, also of your brief? You are muted. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, you're right. So, uh, as I said, the technology is actually is a part of integrated mobility, and um, it is written also in the guideline uh, briefly when we are giving the introduction of the of these services. So, yeah, it can be also used. To, um, I just put, put provided some small, let's say, example of this brief because it's a bit larger of that. And uh, for example, for smart ticketing and smart payment, uh, we provided different uh, different models because it's not only about the public transport, for example, but also, as you said, it's about shared mobility. So here we're talking um, of such modes as a pay as you go or prepaid smart cards. So a different kind of technology that also uh, mentioned in our guidelines. Good, thank you so much. Uh, we, I don't see any hand raised by now, so we still have some, times, uh, some time, uh, so if you want to raise your hand, don't hesitate. Uh, but I switch over to Stefan. Uh, there was one question about your slide on uh, the, um, what was it, the, uh, about the kilometers used uh, by private transport. Uh, in Bucharest, as compared to Vienna and Prague, and the question is how that how that has a relationship with public procurement. Uh, you stopped in in your presentation a little bit and uh, then switched over to the next slide, but it was very interesting how uh, how this uh, looks in a procurement process. Uh, that was an example uh, when uh, so for now Bucharest we consider uh, even if I'm Romanian so. Bucharest is a Roma uh, Romanian capital. Uh, for the moment, uh, is not the best example in how to incorporate external costs in uh, public procurement in mobility area. So, um, when uh, we are developing our uh, uh, projects and uh, run the procurement uh, processes, we uh, need to incorporate some um, awarding criteria. Uh, that will uh, encourage uh, uh, public uh, transport modes or uh, uh, soft uh, mobility transport modes uh, to um, shift from um, more aggressive uh, uh, solutions like the private car to, um, uh, to the others where the external uh, costs are lower. Yeah, so when uh, we uh, this is uh, we may say we uh, this uh, this is also uh, linked to the life cycle cost. So mm -hmm. uh, we need uh, to uh, to see how we incorporate uh, certain criteria over the uh, um, life uh, lifetime of the product in order to encourage uh, more environmentally friendly more city friendly uh, system compared to another that may look cheaper so i hope this mm -hmm. answers to the question yes thanks and then another one for you which will be the last one uh, for today uh, again many thanks 
for being attentive so long. So the question, Stefan, how can a public procurement reform be better adopted by the relevant staff of a municipality if it is so complex, uh, especially in small and medium-sized cities? I think the opportunities for public procurement uh, procedure uh, for public procurement procedures I'm now reading, are lower than in larger cities. I think these procedures must be checked by expertised staff. The criteria must be clear and there must be hierarchy among them. Um, uh, for instance, SSC criteria can be used easily or something complex. So uh, the question is mainly, um, how can we learn this? How can, how can we learn uh, as a staff uh, of a small city, how can we learn all these criteria and how can we sure about applying these in a way that we won't be persuaded by law or whatever uh, problems uh, we have? Um, okay, yeah, this is a key question that uh, we uh, see it also every day here in uh, Romania, so I uh, am not surprised about it, uh, about the question. Um, what we need to keep in mind, uh, and I hope that uh, when you shall read the guideline, you may find more uh, details. Yeah, uh, we encourage, like Alexei said uh, already, please read the guideline and provide the feedback if uh, uh, the ideas are not very clear or something is wrong. But the point is, um, we need to um, make a shift from the classic uh, procurement style where we uh, buy. Uh, some um, products based on very extensive uh, definitions and uh, with uh, 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 important criteria being uh, the price, but rather to identify, and this is linked to uh, what uh, Jana has presented, so to the, to the projects, we need to develop our ideas to um, to identify our goals uh, and these goals uh, and uh, uh, let's call it commercial objectives of the um, uh, product or of the system we need to uh, we need to buy so uh, basically um, i think we can um, summarize the, the idea of um, uh, innovative procurement is shifting from um, acquisition uh, of a um, product that may be very well uh, defined but not suitable to our needs to identify the needs and to buy um, systems that answer to uh, those needs that was a very good summary thanks so much stefan um we here I close our webinar. Uh, again, the link uh, shown here uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so if you want to dive a little bit deeper into those topics that we discussed uh, now, please uh, go to newagendacampus.org, uh, register yourself and take actively part to the forum and the e-learning course. Um, you also see the emails here listed from uh, myself and also uh, the three presenters. So if you have any further leading questions, uh, yeah feel encouraged to ping us an email and uh, let's stay in touch uh, for the rest of the Suits project. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and um, yeah, speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.